Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to discuss the taxes that Great Britain imposed on the colonists today. We will over this in class, but please don't assume that you know everything that I'm going to say. There's a lot of information here, and hearing it again is not going to hurt you. We're going to go in chronological order as we discuss things here. And though it might seem like a lot of time passes between each of these events, remember that communication between Great Britain and the colonists was a little different than communication today. They had no email or phones or airplanes. They had to spread word by mouth-to-mouth, um, -mouth, by person-to-person, -person, or through newspaper articles, or send information across the ocean by boat, which was a little bit slow. Um, remember also in 1763 that we just had the proclamation of 1763, and we said last week that this made the colonists very dissatisfied. They had just um, fought for nine years in the French and Indian War, and they wanted to move over there into that Ohio River Valley, but that proclamation of 1763 kept them from going over there. So the very next year, in 1764, Parliament and King George III passed the Sugar Act. Now, this put a tax on sugar, molasses, and other valuable things that the colonists couldn't purchase um, directly from England. This gave Great Britain and the sugarcane growers in the West Indies a monopoly. Remember, we talked about that word today. A monopoly over sugar because now they were able to sell it to the colonists for cheaper than anyone else. And it was going to be the only sugar that they bought because of that. The other big reason for this tax was to help raise money to pay for the French and Indian War, and the colonists responded to this tax by protesting the law and bribing the tax collectors not to enforce it. Um, we also, the very next year, see the Stamp Act. This is 1765, and this tax was a tax on all legal paper documents, newspapers, almanacs, and playing cards. Also licenses, deeds, like a marriage license or the deed to land. Again, the purpose of this was to help pay for the French and Indian War, but also to pay for these British troops that were now over here in the colonies. And also they had to pay those governors to come over here and enforce British laws. The colonists had a very violent reaction to the Stamp Act. Um, remember that they ran the Stamp Act agents out of town. They had riots, and eventually Great Britain repealed or took away this law in 1766. Now, in 1767, we see the Townsend Acts were established. This tax replaced both the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act. This tax happened at the port. So as things were brought into the colonies, they would have to pay a tax on them. This was stuff like glass, paper, tea, lead, and paint. And as part of their protest of this act, the colonists set up a boycott. They just simply refused to do this. So they claim, and they also claim that this was one of the acts that um, was a violation of their rights as British citizens. They said, why should we have to pay for these things? We're British citizens, just like the people over there in England. And this is not treating us the same. So a few years later, Great Britain repeals this act as well. Now, all of these acts and taxes took place over in England in Parliament, um, where the members of that legislative body, they weren't having to pay these taxes, but they were, however, getting richer by making these taxes go into effect. King George III was happy about these taxes because they were helping pay for the troops that he sent over here to keep the peace, to protect the colonists, and to enforce all of these taxes and laws. All of this happened while the colonists had no one there to represent them in Parliament. They weren't allowed to elect anyone to be um, part of that government body. They had no say in anything. Because of this, the colonists became more and more upset about having to, um, having to pay the taxes, having the British troops marching around the streets all the time, and having the colonial governors that were getting rich and more powerful and probably a little bit cocky because of all this. It also restricted their decision-making in the colonies, um, those, those colonial governors did. They were constantly having to pay more and more for things that they would have been able to get with no problem if they lived back in Great Britain. Now, in 1770, things got ugly. 
the colonists taunted young and unexperienced British troops in the streets of Boston, and stones were thrown, and a jumpy soldier overreacted and shot into the crowd, and in response, everyone started to riot. This caused the death of five men and injured six others, and they labeled this the Boston Massacre. And the colonists were very angry with Great Britain when this happened. Um, it kind of fueled their paranoia that Great Britain was there to hurt rather than help them. They really did not like the, the troops there in the colonies. So after this incident, a group called the Sons of Liberty, which was a patriot group, had some fuel for their argument against Great Britain. And we will talk more about this whole situation in detail uh, later on this week. Now, in 1773, we see one of the most famous boycotts of all time take place. This is the Boston Tea Party. Samuel Adams and Paul Revere led a band of patriots dressed as Indians through the streets of Boston to the Boston Harbor where the, they boarded the ships that were uh, there with all the tea and dumped all the tea into the harbor. This made Great Britain very, very angry. That was a lot of money. And it made the colonists, however, feel like they could do something to go against all the taxes that they didn't like. And in response to this, Great Britain passes what's called the Intolerable Acts in 1774. Now, these Intolerable Acts had four main parts. The first was that they closed the Boston Harbor, and this was very upsetting for the colonists because that's how they made a living. A lot of them in the Boston area made money by shipping things from Great Britain into the Boston Harbor. The Boston Harbor was one of the biggest harbors in all of the colonies. Now, even if it wasn't their way of making money, it limited the other colonists in what they could get from Great Britain because nothing could come in and nothing could go out. The second thing it did was limit the colonists' right to have meetings. So instead of being able to meet whenever they needed to or just, you know, have approval through the governor for decisions they were made, they were only allowed to meet once a year. The third thing it did was that if you were a colonist and you were accused of a crime, you were put on a ship and you were taken back to Great Britain to have your trial and prosecution. This meant that you may never see your family again. Witnesses, if you know, obviously if the crime was happening back in Great Britain, then if you had witnesses, or excuse me, if the crime was happening back in the colonies and you were shipped all the way to Great Britain, your witnesses didn't necessarily get to come with you. So your chance of having a fair trial basically was very, very slim. And then finally, the Quartering Act. This was part of um, this group of laws, and the Quartering Act allowed British soldiers to force their way, their way into and stay in a private citizen's home. The colonists were either forced to share their space with the soldiers, or they were run out of their own home so that the soldiers could live there. Most of the time, they just were forced to live in the same space as the soldiers and kind of take care of them and open up their homes and be hospitable whether they wanted to or not. They had no choice. Um, if you were someone who was against the king at this point, then this meant your family was in great danger. And the result of this for the colonists was that they gathered together 55 delegates from the colonies and formed the first Continental Congress. Now, we're seeing through these events the building of this tension between Great Britain and the colonies, and it's what we call the road to the revolution. It's the cause of the war that eventually forms our country. Now, please remember to fill out your homework worksheet, which looks a little something like half of a page of paper. It was just the eight questions. And the good thing about this video or um, is that if you didn't catch any of the information the first time, you can always go back and review it. And um, I hope that you will use this to help you in the future. And in the meantime, I will see you tomorrow. Bye.